knowing that uh, in maximum security behind the wall where you were sent, I was sent there as well. And, you know, I spent thousands of hours in that cell on 23 hours in one. Mm -hmm. You being an intelligent and creative person, what were some of the ways that you were able to maintain your sanity and maybe even cultivate some of these artistic and academic things you've been able to accomplish as you went into the federal system? One was um, blessed to have a mom who worked at the Library of Congress. And so any literature I want, she could get copied for me and send it to me in the mail. Also started engaging in reading newspapers. I mean, I used to read the Washington Post on the street, but just the Metro and the sports page. But really, like, um, it was an old man named Mr. Fowler. They used to mix our mail up sometimes. because My last name was Flowers, but he really got me to start studying money. His thing was like, man, you know, stop reading the Metro and all. Get into the front page of Global Affairs and start learning about finance and money, investing your money, making an investing money. And so um, and I always had like great mentors. So guys, you know, would hear me rap older guys on the tier. Um, I didn't know that I was intelligent. That's kind of like something I always downplayed. But guys would hear me talk on the tier. They slide me George Jackson. You know, once they slid me George out of there, brother, I was never the same, you know. But um, a guy named Bumpsy, man, he slid me that George Jackson. That I never forget. George, rest in peace to George. This the day that he died. Today. Today. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Comrade George, man, um, you know, Bumpsy came to my cell and was like, have you, do you know who George Jackson is? And I was like, is he Michael Jackson, brother? That's the first. And he laughed, right? <laughs> and he was like, man, I got this book I want you to read. You know, and I read that book, man. I've been reading that book. That was in 98. I've been reading that book since 98. I've been reading that book for um, 26 years and studying and dissecting it. And so um, I had great mentors, man. I never, I never like attracted butt bandits. I never attracted like crash dummies. I always attracted the older guys who were were well read and dangerous, you know. And so me being in the cell with Terry Trice and and Sussex and you know his thing was like yeah people they infatuated with my image because I killed two people in the feds. He said, but they don't see I got out before all of them because I stayed in the law library. He said, that's what I like about you. You stay in the law library. He was like, these guys are stupid. You actually smart. You see what I'm saying? And so um, always had just good mentors. Guys, was, they were dangerous because they could think. They wasn't just dangerous because they were push the knife they was dangerous because you know these guys studied nuclear machiavelli and and, and you know for the uh before the 48 laws of power these guys were on the prince and sun Tzu art of war and they they studied meticulously they had been to the feds you know so they was just a different caliber of men um college educated you know just before the pale grants were you know uh rescinded from prisoners and so these guys had master's degrees in the feds, man. And some of them was doctors in education. And so um, and so it was just a blessing to have that mentorship. Um, those guys, they saw something in me, and you know, they 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 kept me on the weight pile, they kept me in the newspapers, they they kept me in the books, and um, and I listened. You know, I listened. I had I didn't feel no type of way like they was, you know, like. They washed up and they're like, nah, I listen. And like everything they had to give me, I, I, I ate it all. And so I'm really just like a hybrid of all of them. All together. I all see together. you mentioned Terry Trace. You know, he a legendary guy out of Washington, D.C., for anybody who don't know. But you mentioned being Sally's with him in Sussex. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, you know, other notable mentors that you ran into while you were still in Lorton? In Lorton, um, in Lorton, Mr. Fowler, Big Muhammad Abdullah, he gave me my shahada. <laughs> Big Muhammad Abdullah, man, he gave me my shahada, man. Old Jesse Clark. Um, uh, Hawkeye was just a pull-ups. I was just amazed how Hawkeye could do sets of 30s and 40s on the pull-up bar. Um, 
even Lil Twin from D Street, you know, I, I grew up with him, but he was the first guy from my neighborhood, you know, who he, you know, he had got the kite that I was down there. I remember he came to my cell and gave me a radio and a Walkman and really like gave me the lay of the land. And then when we went out for rec from six block, he introduced me to Ernest Smith. And Ernest was out uh, seven block at the time. And me and Ernest ended up getting real cool in Lewisburg. And he, Ernest kind of like mentored me on um, the science of fitness and also economics. Um, Cause I never, I was studying like stocks and bonds, but he kind of got me into micro, macro, micro and macro economics, uh, Karl Marx and Engels, you know, just studying economies and banking, you know, and, and I remember- and I remember um, this one, Ernest and I was in Lewisburg, even though we met in Lord and he was just like, uh, I see you. Cause every night I would go to sell in the corner door makes a lot. And I was like, you going to make a lot. And he'd be like, man, just pray. Right. And so he was like, you, you, you make all these prayers. What you going to do when you get out? Cause you praying, you're going to get out. You got faith. Right? I'm like, yeah. I said, what you, I said, I'm going to get a job. He was like, man, you sound stupid, man. You'll be a fool you get out there and get it. And that was the point that I realized that I wasn't preparing for my freedom. I got so caught up in fighting for it that I didn't even have an economic plan in place. And then from that point on, um, you know, that was like some of the greatest mentorship just in that rhetorical question. Like, what are you going to do when you get out? You know what I'm saying? And so, um, yeah, I met him in Lorton, but, you know, those are like really like Twin, Mr. Fowler, Big Muhammad Abdullah, Hawkeye, Bumps, who gave me the um, Solid Air Brother, and some other guys too. I just can't remember them right now. You know, that was in the 90s. They'll probably come back to me later. But um, yeah, they, they kind of got me away from the rap thing, got me into Burry White and Earth, Wind, and Fire. And that's when I kind of like transitioned from rap to poetry. Man, it's something about DC guys, and I could be being biased, but it's something about DC guys that's our age. All of us met George Jackson, and we all remember who gave it to us the first time. Ned McAllister yeah. gave me my first George Jackson book. Yeah, George was, George is, you know, for me, George changed my life because he showed me that even though I was in prison, that I could create some intellectual property that could be valued in the world in perpetuity. And so that was that spot at the beginning of my bit. It's like, if he could do it, I can do it. Like if he did this from the cell and he came in when he was a juvenile, he had one to life. Um, I just got to keep reading and keep learning and, and keep writing and getting better. And so that was just all that I needed. You know, for some reason, he just resonated with me more than Malcolm X, you know, um, you know, he had a more profound effect. But I, the Malcolm X autobiography was cool, but I saw the movie before I came in. And somebody gave me the book before I came in. I just didn't read it in society. But uh, George Jackson, his letters just had a profound effect on me. How long did you stay in law? I stayed in law from 98 to 2000. Okay. Yeah, I went and, to Sussex. And, uh, and then you went to Sussex. So uh, for those that don't know, Sussex is a state prison in Virginia that they sent D.C. guys to when they was closed in Lawton. And uh, how long did you stay in Sussex? Uh, I think you came like a month after I came. You came from like Arizona. And I was there from like 2000 to 2002. Yeah. I stayed there for like two years, unfortunately. And then you went to uh, the went Feds. Went to Lewisburg. Yeah, I went to the Feds in Lewisburg. Okay, so I'm trying to keep the questions along a chronological timeline that I think I know, so you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong. At what point in time, because I know you did creative things the whole bit, but at mm -hmm. what point in time did you start, like, writing? And when I mean writing, I mean writing books that you are, uh, you know, uh, have published and you are the author of. I, um, I started to see, to write, a, I, I started writing poetry in Sussex and then no in Lorton in Sussex and then when I went to Lewisburg I, I recited one of the pieces at a Morris American uh, spoken word contest and it was a piece about like George Jackson and Fidel and Che and French Fanon all, all these revolutionaries and so uh the old heads like damn sure I didn't know you was deep like that you should write a book 
And right after that, um, I went to the hole and and I started writing a book. I said, well, I'm sending these poems to these women. I said, let me just collect these poems and, and do a book. And then when I got out the hole, I had no idea what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to write a book. That was my intention. And so when I got out the hole, I met a guy named uh, Minka, uh, Michael Norwood out of New Jersey, famous jailhouse lawyer. And he had his own publishing company, another guy named Tyrone Hines from Syracuse. And he had his own publishing company. And so um, they gave me the game. They gave me the game on how to get that ISBN number, that barcode number, and, and, and start my own publishing company. And that's when I started in 2002, 2003. What's the name of your, what, what's the name of your company? Your publishing one? Uh, Sato Publishing Struggled Against the Odds is an acronym. Yes. All right, so uh, this occurred basically roughly Sussex to the feds. You already started this mm -hmm. writing transition, correct? Yeah. All right, before I go too far to the federal, to your federal journey, right? Uh, I got to ask you this for just for the sake of some things that I represent. Uh, how was it for you being mm -hmm. a black man from Washington, D.C., going into the federal system? Um, before I got to the feds, I was in Sussex. I watched this movie called Babylon in Brooklyn. And not knowing at that time, the people who produced the Thug Life in D.C. documentary that I was in, um, that we filmed up the jail, um, they had produced this movie. But it stopped, it's, it's, it, the star of the movie is Black Thought. He's a roster friend in Brooklyn, and he falls in love with this Jewish girl. So it was just telling like the history of the roster friend, their culture, and then the Jewish culture. And I remember I told some, I said, man, when I go to feds, I'm gonna study everything. Like, I'm not looking for a different religion, but I want to like meet Bloods, Crips, people from the Midwest. Um, I just wanted to just learn people. And so uh, when I got to the feds, man, um, that's how I really approached it. Like, man, because the old heads was like, you know, man, everybody hate us, we from DC and this and that. And, um, and I saw that too, but I didn't really like going, I didn't go with that mentality, like everybody hates me. And so by me being Muslim and being attached to the Muslim community like I was, a lot of guys didn't know where I was from because I sat with the Muslims. Sometimes I would sit with the homies, but sometimes I would sit with the Muslims. So a lot of guys, they thought I was from Philly. They didn't know I was from DC. And so I remember one time I was rapping and I was like, you know, DC dude, and I pointed to a dude from Philly, a dude from Philly, like, man, I ain't from DC. So I was like, damn, why you? I was like, he was like, nah, I just caught my case in DC. I'm like, I ain't from DC. I was like, damn, I'm from DC. And he was like, yeah. You know, I was like, yeah. So in the feds, dudes used to always say, hey, you, don't, you don't sound like them. You don't act like them. So I'd be like, how we act? You know what I'm saying? They was like, they wouldn't want to say that, but some guy, man, your homie's arrogant. Like, you real humble. And so, um, so for me, it was like initially when I got there, you know, Lewisburg, the two homies got killed. You know, that's hanging over in the air by the, you know, with the Aaron Brotherhood stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm on George Jackson time. So I'm boots laced up, you know, working out like a machine. And, um, but I really just, I really like came there. I just really wanted to learn, right? And I wanted to get the hell out of jail more than anything. And so, um, it was unusual because like I was one of the only young guys that really was in the law library and so um, but yeah just being black and from D.C. you know a lot of people don't like people from D.C. but I'm, I'm weird like that I can like people and they don't they don't even have to like me um, I'm, I'm just not a I don't know I'm not a hater man I'm not a hater I'm not pessimistic I understand the the um I understand why people don't like people from DC. Um, and there's some things I I can agree with and some things I don't. Um, but you know, um, I didn't allow that to like make me not like them. You know what I'm saying? Not like I was a pushover or friendly good, because I, I really don't talk to a lot of people. Um, you know, you was in with me, you know how I am. And so, but you know, when I met good people, um, I embraced them. 
And so um, and some of those relationships stand today. So when I go to Seattle or, you know, I go to L.A., I, I meet guys who I did time with, you know. And so, um, but yeah, that was that was my thing. You know, I knew it was it was serious going to Lewisburg to the big house. And um, but, you know, um, I had an objective to learn and to get out of prison. And, and I just stayed focused on that. Let me ask you another question. And I, I wouldn't if it wasn't you. And I didn't trust that you could answer it correctly. I wouldn't mm -hmm. ask you this, but I'm going to ask you something just to be challenging. As a guy, as a homie, you a homie, mm -hmm. whether, whether you accept it or not, we, we people, we understand that. Mm -hmm. As a Muslim and as mm -hmm. a homie, can you expound on or do you have any experience with the with a con with, with conflicts that involve mm -hmm. guys from Washington, D.C. and guys from the Muslim community while in prison? Do you have any knowledge of that? And did you ever have to deal with that conflict? And if so, how would you how did you deal with that? Because I had that conflict and a lot of people said they had that conflict. Can you expound on that? Yeah, I had that conflict. When I was 23, I was the assistant imam. And so I was like, you know, one of the youngest people in that position in, in Lewisburg history. So a lot of the uh probably the youngest. And so a lot of the SIS and stuff, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't like it. You know, they didn't, they didn't, especially me being from Washington and they were, they were scared. Then I was, you know, I was on George Jackson time too. And so um, they were unsettled, you know, this administration and staff. But when the situation happened with the, uh, a Muslim brother and, and a homie, um, and a homie stabbed the, uh, the brother, um, the brother was wrong, but it's like, it just, <laughs> it got out of hand pretty fast. And so um, I think had I not been an assistant imam, it, it would have got ugly because a lot of the homies, you know, loved me and respected me. And it was a conflict amongst the homies. They wanted they wanted to, uh, to bring the brothers a move, but they knew where I stood. And so some of them, um, they just was like, man, if we can't get Shorty out the way, we can't do nothing because the homie came out on top anyway, but the little fight that we had on the yard with the homies and the Muslims, um, you know, some of the homies wanted to retaliate and, you know, some of the homies, like, you know, uh, they was like, I'm not going against him. And so they kind of like took my side and they wasn't even Muslims. They just was homies. And so, um, and so it, I think just my standing with the homies a lot of older homies respected me. Um, and then my, my homies that were my peers that kind of came up with me, they they respected me. And so it was that was once that was like the only situation that I that was serious. Like because the homie, he um he dogged the Muslim brother. But what happened was the Muslim brother had just stepped away from the community. He was like, Man, I ain't with the Muslims no more, this and that. But when he got dog, a lot of people didn't know that he had took that stance to step away from the community. So they just responded like a Muslim got hit. Everybody was on the yard, the homies, the Muslims, and it just resulted in a little a brawl, melee. Um, and you know, people went to the shoe and stuff like that. But um, that was a serious situation though, because I was in a cell with a homie at that time uh who had killed the killed the homie down low and bought a ping pong ball. And so uh, that was my Sally, you know what I'm saying? He, <laughs> and so, but for me, it was like, um, you know, we all men. It, it, was, it, it was weird though, because, you know, he a homie, I'm a Muslim. Uh, we, our, you know, our teams are at odds and I'm like the assistant imam. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm second in command, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, but it was a real, it was a very um, dangerous situation. But like I said, um, it goes back to having the ability to be able to articulate your thoughts. I think that inability to be able to uh, engage in diplomacy in a way in which you can create win-win situations where neither party feel like they compromise their morals and principles. Um, that's how you have conflict. And so I was able to resolve that and when the imam left and they wanted me to be the imam, I was like, hell nah. <laughs> I, I, 
they drove me crazy, man. Yeah, they drove me crazy. So I, I never took a position like that again. Um, not because of that incident. It was just it's like it's it's a lot, you know, managing people. I, I don't really like to manage people. I like to more be like an advisor to the leaders. Um, but um, that that was one situation happened in Lewisburg. Um, and you know, and so you know, you got some homies don't like that. They don't like you know they don't they don't like the fact that you know. Um, that you would go with the Muslims over your homies. But for me, it's not the Muslims. I've explained to them, like, I'm not choosing the people over you. I'm choosing Allah over you. Like, I pray. Like, where do I look like putting my forehead on the ground five times a day and then put you over that? I said, I might as well prostrate to you. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, and you know, people may be atheists or just non-religion. They don't understand that deep, uh, commitment to something like that but it's not about the people like i'm like nah personally i don't even anybody who was in ramadan in lewisburg with me tell you every ramadan i go sit by myself that's how disgusted i was with the people you know what i'm saying muslims and so but i don't do it for them i do it for a lot 